Sure. Um, so just to start with a, a quick introduction, um, I'd like to say um, thank you to everyone for joining the first um, online webinar of the Lina Gel London um, meetup group. Um, we wanted to do an experiment which was trying to get people that are difficult to get to London to be able to talk, to get people into our, into our, into our offices, into our houses and um, also help minimize our carbon footprint. So we went as far as we could go and we managed to get an event that is running on two consecutive days because Clark is based in New Zealand and he just had breakfast, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So it's Friday morning over there, Thursday evening here in London, um, and it's an absolute honor to, to have Clark Ching joining us for the first time. I stop there, it will be just great. Um, this is for it, Clark, it's all yours. Hi, it's all mine. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so uh, I'm in New Zealand, which as you can see from the map here, um, doesn't actually exist, but I, I promise I am. And I'm also here from the future, uh, which does exist, and you'll have it's a little bit cloudy today in the future. You've got something to look forward to. Right, so today we are talking about bottlenecks. Um, I'm going to start with a little trick question. And I'm not expecting any answers yet. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit more information, which will explain why it was a trick question uh, at the end uh, of the, the chat. Okay, so just imagine it's early in the morning, you're walking along and uh you're in a new town a uh, new city and you're looking thinking wow i would really like um a cup of coffee and on one side of the road you see the blue coffee shop and it's only got two people standing in front of the till ordering you think hey that's good and you look across the road and you see the green coffee shop and there's a whole lot of people waiting uh to order so of course uh, you go to the blue coffee shop or do you? Uh, because if the green coffee shop uh, has so many customers standing outside it, what do they know that uh, the uh, people that are going to the blue coffee shop don't know? So this is a bottleneck problem. Um, queues are the symptoms of bottlenecks, waiting lines, waiting lists, queues, uh, and they're, they're kind of like the symptoms and they're also usually the um like at the scene of a crime uh they are the evidence that, that's left behind so we can talk about bottlenecks how to go faster how to get more productivity by thinking rather than working harder and um yeah we'll just see how we go here so uh that's the book i wrote the bottleneck rules um you also may know me from uh uh, Rolling Rocks Downhill, which uh, both of these books are about uh, a thing called the theory of constraints. That I've tried to um, not overemphasize that they're uh, the theory of constraints because really they're, they're just about common sense. But it's the common sense you can't see until you can see it and have some, someone's pointed it out to you. So the bottleneck rules, the, um, the, 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 the title is a play on words. It's the idea that in your business, the bottleneck is in charge, the, the bottleneck rules. Uh, and there is really only one bottleneck rule, which is the, the bottleneck rules. Now, um, so there's that book. If you would like a free copy of it, go to share.toc.guide. Now, I know it's easy to write a book. Uh, it's easy to say you've written a book. It's very easy to say you've written a book. Um, but uh, this book was featured in The Guardian. It was uh, in The Spectator. It's been on Amazon. It was the number two best-selling leadership book for three or four days, uh, this time last year, actually, um, on Amazon.com. Uh, and Stephen Covey's book was in front of it, and How to Win Friends and Influence People was just behind it. And probably the difference, big, big difference in my mind between my book and uh, their book is that I didn't pay for advertising to get it sold or sponsorship, as Amazon calls it. So there's that one. You can get a free copy there, share.toc.guide. If you're not watching this, that is Sheer, S-H-A-R-E, uh, not like the singer, the, the lady singer, Sheer. Okay, so uh, Rolling Rocks Down the Hill is the, the one um, I'm best known for, uh, and now Bottleneck Rules is doing pretty well. So I'm going to give you the secret of the Bottleneck Rules, so you can get a free copy of it, but you don't even have to read it. Uh, right, now, 
that there in front of us is what's known as a bottle uh, and that bit there is also known as a bottle and between them oops thank you keynote sorry uh bottle a bottle and they both have a neck 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 uh, the neck the, the neck's the narrow bit uh the bottle neck is the narrow bit of the bottle so literally that's what it means it's the narrow bit uh, in a flow now there's a reason if you look at these two bottles here one of them's wine um and the other one is a hot chili sauce really 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 uh both fantastic products here uh, both made locally. And the only trouble with these is if they had the same bottleneck size, uh, it'd be a disaster. Like if the um, the, the red wine uh, had a narrow neck, you'd um, not get much wine out of it and possibly die of sobriety. Uh, and the uh, chili pepper bottle, if it had a big thick neck, you'd go to pour it on your food um, and you would ruin it with a uh, piping hot, delicious sauce. So actually, bottlenecks, uh, if you don't know they're there in your system and they're hidden, they're bad. But if they're deliberate like this, they're good. Um, and we'll, 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 yeah, we'll talk more about that as we go. So I would like to take you back to Dublin in 1999, which is when I uh, left New Zealand for two years and ended up uh, getting married in Dublin and then moving to um, Edinburgh a few years later, uh, where I lived. And we, we just moved back to New Zealand two or three years ago. So this Clark, was weird. Clark, you just have to one. Your slides don't seem to be changing. In the, the what, sorry? The slides don't seem to be changing. Oh. We still have your intro cool. slide. I'll stop sharing them and then I'll start sharing them again. Okay. All right. That any better? Let's see. Better. Change one and see. Okay. All right, is that changing? All right, just a quick uh, read. For, there's me, bottleneck rules. There's a map of the world without New Zealand on it. There's the two queues, the blue shop uh, with very few people in front of it and the green shop with a lot of people. Uh, there's the book and there is share.toc.guide. Uh, free copy of that book. Uh, and there's a couple of other books. Right, and we're nearly back where we were again. Ah, and now two bottles, one with a wider neck and one with a thinner neck, and Dublin, yay. Okay, thanks for that, Jose. Okay, so um, this is the first time I tackled a bottleneck in the wild for real. Um, and I'll just tell it to you because it's a really startlingly obvious example when you see it, but this, the bottleneck was very well hidden at the time uh, in, in real life. So you know, I just need to get rid of this, this blocking this. Um, the situation here was that this was a new telecoms company that was competing against uh, the Irish equivalent of BT. And uh, the accounts department um, had set up a few years previously a software system to do their accounts but the company had been very successful and grown enormously and was building a fiber optic network across all of ireland and it was all going well um, the fiber optic network except that the suppliers the vendors the, the people who were working on it um, weren't being paid and they had threatened to um to, to, to stop working on it uh, and they were going to down tools, and this was uh, devastating news for the company. Uh, and, and the problem was that the accounting department just didn't have a, the capacity inside it uh, to process all of the invoices that they were getting through. So I'm just going to talk you through quickly the process. Um, there, actually, there, no, there are a few other bad things that are happening. The accountants were really stressed because the suppliers were ringing in saying, Hey guys, pay me my money. And they were very, very angry conversations. And these were just um, ordinary people, their accountants, they were leaving because they, they, they didn't want to work in a place like that. And they had options. And one day I got, uh, uh, her name was Sinead. Um, she was the, in charge of the accountants. Uh, she came up to me and just was really sad. She just told me her, this little story about how everything was collapsing around her. And she said, no matter how hard we work, we can't keep up. So, so I asked her um, if she could just describe her process. B 
because a few years prior to this, I'd read this book called The Goal, which is uh, the original theory of constraints book, a big, thick novel, a little bit um, outdated now, but uh, um, it was a great book at the time. Um, and it still is a great book, to be fair. And I'd read this book and it was about a factory that had a bottleneck in it. And, and just the way she's talking, it, it sounded very similar, um, even though this was a bunch of accountants, not, not a factory. So I asked her to describe her process and she said there were five steps. She held her hand up in the air and then she said, um, I'll tell you about them. So she described each of the five steps. And the first one started with the office junior opening the, the um, collecting and then opening the invoices that had been posted into the mail room. And the last one was uh, uh, where they pushed the button and checks were printed and sent out. And so the rest was blah, 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 uh, was counting stuff. Um, so I uh, just asked her very tentatively, because this was brand new to me. Um, excuse me. How many? Uh, I'm sorry here. I'm having technical difficulties with my mouse. I just decided to stop working. So apologies for that. So I, I asked how many invoices for each of the five steps could the team process per day? And she came up with the first step. There was oh, easily 90, perhaps. The second one, 40. Uh, the third one, 60. Uh, the next one, 20. And the next one, because it was an automated process, say 20,000. So she, she gave me these numbers and we rattled around them, um, with them for just a few moments. She wrote them out on the board. Uh, and then she goes, oh my God. And, and I hope it's just as clear to you uh, that the fourth step there with 20, um, it was the slower step in the flow. And so uh, the entire process was only working at the speed of that step because it was a bottleneck. So it didn't matter if the, um, the, the finger that's got 60 on it at the moment, uh, if you suddenly looked and you could improve that to get 90, um, you'd still only get 20 out of that system each day because of the fourth step. So it's gotten fairly obvious. And she, she, I remember seeing her and her jaw dropped and she goes, oh my God, oh my God. Is it, is, is, is it, it's, like, it's like a bottleneck, it's like that one step. And then she said, and I know how to fix that because I do that step. Uh, and she was the most senior uh, accountant. So all she did was just lock herself in a room um, for four, six hours on, 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 on the following day. Uh, and then for just a, a dedicated time each day after that. And she just increased her capacity from 20 up to about um, 50. Um, and suddenly the, the, the whole, uh, the entire process sped up from uh, 20 to 40, which was the, the next um, bottleneck. And that, that was really easy. That this problem, which had been plaguing them for months uh, and was threatening the huge, huge uh, multi-million pound investment was fixed uh, over a 10 minute conversation and then uh, a little bit of dedicated work. Uh, yeah, and that was it. And now you would think that that's pretty obvious, but it was only obvious when it was um, pointed out because there was so much stuff, people ringing up being angry, um, so much angry, angry uh, stuff, people leaving, having to replace people. Uh, and, and who dealt with most of that? It was, uh, it was Sinead. Uh, the, the, the lady that I was helping, the one who was the bottleneck. So she was the bottleneck, but um, by not dedicating time to her job, uh, she'd made herself the bottleneck and then she'd made herself busy fixing all of the, uh, the, the hassles and the rework that were coming out of that. So that is the idea um, of a bottleneck inside a flow. Key point about that, that that's not always obvious, is that they're obvious when they get pointed out, but they're really good at hiding sometimes. Uh, and finally, bottlenecks are resources, not steps. So I presented this as, as steps here, but the, the bottleneck was uh, the lady, uh, Sinead, um, the, the resource that was doing it. All sorts of resources there. Um, uh, it could have been a slow computer. Uh, it could have been a different uh, job type, uh, but um, bottlenecks are resources, not steps. Right, now let's step over quite a few years. I've moved to Edinburgh. Uh, and there's Princess Street there. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see a double rainbow, uh, which I'm quite pleased to have got that picture. Um, this 
story. Again, it's true. Um, this took place in Edinburgh, a large financial company there. Uh, the CIO asked me if I would have a look at his team, uh, the team that were responsible for fixing all of the major defects um, uh, that they, they got in. These were not development defects, these were live defects uh, and um, in a really old gnarly system and they, uh, you know, mixture of COBOL, all sorts of uh, technologies that many people probably haven't even heard of uh, uh, these days. It was a team of 16 people plus a manager. Uh, they had the usual mix of roles. Uh, very, very, very good, hardworking team working on really hard bugs. The CIO comes to me and says, look, Clark, um, could you please help us out? Just go have a look at that team. Uh, they're currently working through 10 a month, 10 defects a month. So a team of 16 and they're fixing 10 defects a month. This is the nature of the defects. These are hard ones to fix. And could you go have a look at them? Um, because I've promised that um, we're going to get rid of the top 120 of them. Well, at least we'll get them down to single figures before the end of the year. And to do that, they need to go 30% faster. And I said, oh, 30% faster, that's, that's quite a lot faster. And he says, yeah, 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 but don't, don't worry, um, you, you're, you're not my last resort, right? Just go and have a look and see what you can do. Uh, because, uh, look, um, I've got the option in a few months of delaying uh, the start of some new projects. And if we can't find a way to speed this guys up, we'll just chuck developers at them. Uh, and, and in October, we'll just chuck a bunch of developers at them uh, and then we'll just blitz through them. So it won't be a problem, but just go have a look. I'd rather not um, have to do that. So I went and had a look and I spoke to Eve. Um, Eve was the, the, the team's manager and we sat down and we talked through stuff and she gave me sort of just pretty much the details that I've just described to you. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Then I said to her, well, could I have a look maybe and just see where all of the defects are? You know, like maybe if you've got a defect tra tracking system, can I get a report out of there or something? She says, oh, no, 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 just, just turn around and look behind you. And so I turned around and there were whiteboards there. Uh, so uh, it, 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 a chap uh, who worked there previously had set up a nice little um, uh, bunch of whiteboards to, to track the uh, the, 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 the progress of, of each of the defects and each defect had a sticky and so there's my uh, very clever artist impression of these whiteboards and I looked at them and I imagine um, you're having a similar reaction as I did at that stage and I'm going don't they tear stuff well maybe maybe the programmers test all the stuff okay all right and then I noticed that hidden behind the third board. There seemed to be another board. And so I wandered around and I had a look. And it turned out that the test team had their own board with an awful lot of stickies on it. And Eve explained to me, oh, those, those stickies, we used to just have three of them here, but what happened is we got so many stickies built up for the test team, we just bought them another board, but then it was too um, wide to fit. Uh, in the room and it would have blocked the corridor. So we just tuck it around behind this. And, you know, they, um, so, so the developers and analysts and, and the, the designer, well, um, they, they chat about those three things. And then the testers, two of them, they catch up later on and um, they have their own little stand-ups. It's sort of pretty agile, eh? Um, yeah, and I looked at that and I thought, yeah, that's a really good start. It's, it's actually really handy because, um, and why I share this example is because it was just so visually obvious uh, that there was a, the bottleneck was testing. There was a big, big, big pile of yellow stickies built up uh, on the testers board. Uh, and that was happening because the upstream steps, the analysis, design and coding, uh, were happening faster than the testers could process them. So there was a bottleneck. So, Eve and I, sat down and I told her about Sinead in Ireland all those years ago and I told her that story and 
Sinead, um, sorry, I just, there was just a noise outside, <laughs> apologies for that. And uh, Eve, sorry, said, oh, I'll, I'll run through and I can roughly guess the, um, the, the, the numbers for each of these stages, which wasn't really necessary because the, the evidence was pretty clear that um, what was happening. But she ran through anyway, just for, for the comfort of it. Uh, 20 analysis per month, she thought, yeah, that's the, what they could do if they wanted to. 25 design, 15 programming, and obviously 10 a month of test. And she knew it would be 10 a month because that was what the whole team was accomplishing and they were, um, you know, the last step. So she goes and she looks at that and goes, oh, okay, yeah. Test is definitely the slowest step, isn't it? Yep. Uh, and that's why there's this big build up, you know, kind of like a, a, a lot of um, patients in the emergency room uh, on a Friday night, built up, waiting in front of the bottleneck. Okay, all right, that's interesting. And then she said, right, um, let's get our team together and just run through this and see what we can do. So rather than doing that straight away, I wandered around and I just had a few chats with people because what I found is... I think this is a rule, but I, I, I try and disprove it, is that if people don't know where their bottleneck is, uh, then it's managing them, they're not managing it. Uh, and a lot of the problems that they're having are usually caused because they have an invisible bottleneck in their system. Uh, so I went off, I wander around, I talked to people and try and prove that uh, wrong, that, um, you, you know, that, that, that thing about the guy that has the hammer um, only sort of sees nails. I, I, I see bottlenecks and I wanted to make sure it wasn't that. But I wandered around and it was definitely that. So I got everyone in the room, we talked about it. There were um, 17, 18, including me, all crammed into a conference room and we just sort of started talking about stuff. And then... Uh, I, I got to a point where I said, look, I, I need to tell you a, a joke um, to make this clear. And um, here goes the joke. I'll point out the bit where you're supposed to laugh, just in case you don't. Right, so the buffalo story started out as an email joke, and it was an imagined story Sorry, on Cheers, the TV show. Uh, it never actually happened in the, the, the real uh, TV show, but in the early 2000s, late 90s, when jokes traveled the world by email, uh, it was, um, th th this came around and it sums up the, the core idea of the theory of constraints, um, magnificently, I think. So uh, Cliff Clavin, the odd postal worker, um, comes in, sits down at the bar and he says, well, you see, Norm, it's like this. A herd of buffalo can only move as fast as the slowest buffalo like this. See how slow they move? That, by the way, took me about three months to get that to work. The slowest buffalo, they stay at the back of the herd and the faster buffalo run in front, but obviously at the, the slowest speed. Otherwise the herd would spread apart. Like this. And when they were split apart like that, they'd be prone to attack from wolves. There goes one, there goes another one. And evolution favoured the herds that didn't spread apart. And when these tightly packed herds were hunted, the wolves killed the slowest and the weakest buffalo. And where were they? They were the guys at the back. And that made the remaining herds stronger and faster. Whew. There you go, great animation. I hope that uh, comes across the internet as swishy as it looks on my screen. So here's the, here's the joke bit, okay? In much the same way, the human brain can only operate as fast as the slowest brain cells. That's a well-established scientific fact, I think. And now, as we know, excessive intake of alcohol kills brain cells. But naturally, it attacks the slowest and the weakest brain cells first, of course. What else would you expect? And in this way, regular consumption of beer eliminates the weaker brain cells, making the brain a faster and more efficient machine. And that norm is why you always feel smarter after a few beers. Yay! So there you go. So I tell them this little joke. Uh, they have a little bit of a laugh and a, and a snigger. Um, they find this uh, mildly uh, amusing. And of course, they point out one or two people who 
um, like their beer and, and they just have a bit of a giggle together uh, and that the whole mood of the, the, the meeting uh, changes. Uh, and, and that's the funny thing I find with this joke, when people have a laugh, they start to get a little bit more collaborative because they're laughing together. They, they, they start getting, their, their minds seem to switch into a more creative problem solving mode. Uh, and, and this almost always happens. So we switch back uh, to our problem. And apologies, I'm just moving things from Zoom here around on my screen. So I don't, uh, I'm, I'm just losing some of the words. There we go, I can see now. So we switch back and uh, say, so right, okay, you heard about the slowest uh, buffalo, right? Yeah. Now, where's your slowest buffalo? And they all go, oh, it's testers, obviously. So obviously the, the testers, and they always point. And then someone, and, and if this was a live session, someone would say, this now, and I know at least five of you were thinking it. Ah, ah, so why don't we shoot the the the, uh, the testers then? And of course, in real life, that's what someone said. They had a bit of a laugh, and and just recently, someone suggested that if they want to work with um, the, the the theory properly, they should actually feed the testers more beer, and, and that'll probably make them go faster. But uh, someone says, well, shall we shoot the testers then? And they all laugh, ha ha ha. But then they get serious. And they're looking at the whiteboard, and now you see here a um, uh, the steps folding out below you on the, the bottom of the screen. Is find your bottleneck as the first step, uh, and, and these are laid out in the book in, in detail. Um, optimize your bottleneck as the second step. So they find the bottleneck. They go, well, how can we make the testers go faster? And you, you naturally think here of things like, well, cool, they they must surely be able to be a bit cleverer at testing and. Could they do some time management stuff? There's some unnecessary meetings that could cancel. Just little things like that. And you might think they're trivia, but the point of the bottleneck is that in a team of 16, there were two testers, uh, and those two testers determined the entire output of the whole team. So if they could go 10% faster. That meant the entire team went 10% faster. If anyone else went 10% faster, it amounted to nothing. Uh, but that's why focusing, finding the bottleneck, and then looking to see if you can optimize it is important. But less in this case, this team had been working together for, um, these two people have been working together for uh, several months. Uh, they got along really well, uh, and they worked really, really, really hard. Uh, they worked overtime. Uh, they had taken, stripped every ounce of fat off their working practices. So there was no chance to optimize, which was disappointing because usually there is, but never fear, we haven't finished yet. So we ran through that, spent 10 minutes talking about things, uh, could we optimize and then eventually I said, well, how can the faster buffalo help out? And they were looking at your faster buffalo. Well, you, you guys that aren't the bottleneck, the non-bottlenecks, pretty much everyone else, is there a way you could help? And immediately the testers, Oh, sorry, I just got a, a late delayed message from Jose there. Sorry about that. Yep. Um, th these are the, the, the tags of using Zoom across the internet. Uh, it's great, but it comes with a little bit of uh, extra stress thrown in. Uh, so um, how can the faster buffalo help? We um, obviously, uh, the first step, that this was just really obvious that is, they had to do what the buffalo did. Uh, and that just slowed down, uh, which wasn't a very easy discussion to have to start with. But the testers were like, look, if you guys, you, you guys, you're always, you're racing ahead of us. Um, we need to do this. You, you don't, um, if, if, if you're delayed, you have no worries about uh, interrupting us. Um, how about if you just stopped interrupting us? That would be really good. And, and obviously you need to slow down because if you keep working like this, all you're doing is adding things to the test board um, and we can't get them any faster so you've got to go down. Now the, the developers of course um, were overly keen on this um, and they had a little bit of a think about it and they said well yeah well, okay we, we it makes sense we need to slow down what could we do instead so go back to the the question in green at the top there how can the faster buffalo help how could they help so slow down is one thing not distracting the testers is another thing 
oh, is there a way that we could help you guys do your testing? Um, he said that didn't actually come from the developers because developers don't normally really want to help out with manual testing. Uh, that was, I think, me that probably suggested that. Is there any way that the developers could maybe do some of the testing? And they were like, all around, no. The developers weren't keen and the testers said that they weren't keen because um, they actually had a rule against it in this place because every time that uh, they tried to speed up testing by getting developers to test, uh, it um, just makes everyone angry and it actually loses them productivity. So they had banned it. Um, now, that, that's not always the case. I, I've had that work reasonably well, but it was okay in this case, so we can't do that. What else could the, the developers do if it's not manual testing to help you guys out then, to help you two testers? Hmm. Well, there is something that's actually not technically manual testing. Uh, you could help us with that, which is keying in like our test data. That'd be really cool if you could do that because that's so frustrating. And, and one of the developers said, no, I'm not doing that. And we, we all turned to him and he said, oh, well, no, I'll, I've got a script that does that and I use it. Have we not ever showed you the scripts to set up data? And the test is going, no, no, I guess you've been too busy. Um, so they go, well, okay, well, so they agreed to share some scripts uh, and the developers would uh, use their scripts to automate a currently manual process that was done by the botany, which was the data setup. So that, that, that sounded pretty good. And then they thought, was there anything else? And they ummed and ahed and they couldn't really think of anything. And then the developers, one of the developers said, hey, here's, a, here's an idea. You know how you guys are always having trouble with your test environments and you come to us to fix them and we say, oh yeah, we'll look at that in the afternoon. How about if we just looked at that straight away? You, you, if you're being slowed down by a test environment, um, how about from now on, we'll just fix it immediately. They go, yeah, that would, that would definitely um, speed things up. And then uh, another developer said, well, wh why don't we just own the test environments? You know, um, well, we'll just make sure that they're always good. Uh, and we'll just look after them, we'll clean them up a bit. Um, you know, because there's stuff that we can do that you guys can't do. And, and why don't we do that? We've got spare time up our sleeves anyway. Okay, okay cool, yep, yeah, right. So they agreed to do that. So those two things were, um, uh, were, were really the, the main things that they did uh, to do it. So I'll just run through the bottom. We've got find, optimize, coordinate, and collaborate. Uh, and there's a third C here, which is curate. Uh, you notice this is spelling the word focus, by the way. Um, the curate step is not looking at your process, but looking at what you feed into your process. Uh, so I chose this word curate for this step, and it's hugely valuable, and, and we don't do it nearly enough. Uh, I, I chose it because if you think of a museum which has a limited amount of display space, and they all do, uh, but they have huge stocks of stuff that they could put out display in the public areas. So they have a precious, scarce space, which is analogous to a bottleneck, uh, and they have a whole lot of stuff and they want to pass it through that space in the best way they, have, they can. So they curate that and they actually have a job title, the curator of a magazine, uh, a museum, sorry, um, uh, process uh, chooses what to pass through their bottleneck. Um, it, it's also true with magazines. Uh, the cu curator of a magazine, uh, is the editor, chooses what to, to, you know, to put in the magazine. So curation is really key here. And in agile environments, this is the stuff that we do with our backlog uh, to make sure that the right stuff's going into the team. Now, I want to add a little sort of a, a little slant to this because um, when we curate, we don't normally think of um, so when we prioritize our backlog, we don't normally take into account where the bottleneck is. So just, just with this example, for instance, um, they wanted to get through these things quickly. Um, and they knew that they had 120 and they wanted to get it down below 10. So uh, what they did is work through, they tidied up a lot of the stuff that uh, were on the boards and getting ready. And then they worked through and they figured out which ones would be easy to test. Uh, and which ones would be harder to test. Uh, and they put the ones that were hard and confusing to test at the bottom, uh, and they moved the other ones up uh, to the top. 
Uh, and then they found some that they thought would be diabolical to test. So they moved them right to the bottom and put them in their little buffer of 10 that they wouldn't complete by the end of the year. Uh, and they did a whole lot of stuff, but not just assuming um, that it was the, de excuse me, the development effort uh, that would help in the prioritizing. But in this case, because the bottleneck wasn't development um, and they had plenty of spare programmer capacity, uh, they prioritized according to testing. And now just imagine if you're in a development um, environment and for some reason testing is your bottleneck and you've got a story coming and it's a reasonably chunky story and there's two ways of doing it. One which requires a lot of developer effort uh, and the other one which require, uh, sorry, a lot of development effort, but it's very easy to test versus one that requires a tiny bit of developer effort and a lot of testing. If, if testing is your bottleneck, you should take the solution, um, considering other things around it, of course, but you should take the solution that um, requires the least amount of testing time. Uh, if developers were the bottleneck and you had spare testing capacity, you'd flip it, flip it around the other way. So this is a really um, important point now, uh, is that you prioritize according to your bottleneck, not just according to value and the total amount of effort. And that makes a huge difference. So that, that's curation. There's a whole lot more that goes with uh, curation in the real world that's fascinating. Um, but uh, we will move on because the next step is to upgrade. Now, this was the obvious um, first choice in this case. And in different circumstances, th th this is actually what I would have jumped. I would have jumped straight to upgrade and I, I hired another tester. Um, and, and just, it, it's not balanced correctly. They just needed one more tester. That was really uh, an obvious, easy solution. But as it turns out, these testers uh, in this particular case were a, a very scarce resource and they couldn't hire people to do this job because the ramp up time for them once they started till they got productive uh, was many months. So they would have actually slowed down as they were assisting new people to come on board. So they, they, they um, crossed that one off off the list. But often you can um, just spend a little bit of money and get a huge amount of performance. So just imagine in this case, uh, if, if you wanted to, this team to go 50% faster, they had two testers, adding one more tester because it was the bottleneck, uh, would take that number there up to 20% uh, to 20 per month in the testing. Uh, and it wouldn't actually give you 50% because programming would then become the bottleneck. Um, so you get a 25% increase for a tiny percentage of income. Sorry, I hope I haven't muddied the, um, the, 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 I haven't confused by any numbers yet. I'll just move on. Right, and then the last step is to actually start again because the bottom net moves. Now, I want to just show you here, this is the, the focus formula. Uh, you've just seen a, an explanation of it in, in the real world. Uh, and this is different to what Ali Goldratt, who was the founder of the theory of constraints used. He used a thing called the five focusing steps. I don't like that language, um, but these uh, two are totally complementary. This is just good. To just think of this one um, more as a bunch of prompts to help you think about um, how you might handle it once you've found your bottleneck. So find and optimize and upgrade work directly on the bottleneck. And the three C's, uh, they work on the non-bottlenecks. All right. Okay, so that, that's wrapped up with the example. Now, I want to come back to this trick question because it is kind of tricky. Uh, and it's actually true. This is, a, this is an example. I, I stumbled across this in uh, Wellington where I was working for a wee while uh, here, here in New Zealand. And there was indeed a shop that had a very, very short queue uh, at the beginning of it. And you walk up to it and go, wow, there's only one person, two people in the queue, fantastic for a coffee shop at quarter to nine. Well, hey, and then you go in, they would rush over and they would take your order. Uh, and now there's something that they didn't show you here. If you're looking at the green one there, uh, is it all of those people who are on the right-hand side of the blue cup they were actually waiting for the orders. So all that had happened there is that the queue of people that indicates that there is a bottleneck and that the system can't keep up had moved from the left-hand side and they had become prisoners because the company had taken their money on the um, right-hand side while they were still waiting for their coffee. Now, 
the reason why the green one, it looked bad there, um, if you didn't know what was going on, but they took the order uh, and they turned around their coffee very, very quickly. So all of the locals, uh, they knew that um, the queue was on the outside, but it was actually faster uh, than the other shop uh, because you'd, get, you'd pay your money and they would um, hand you your coffee and leave. And how did they hand you your coffee and leave? They had uh, someone taking the orders by walking up and down the queue that was waiting and then going back. So the um, effectively the paying and the making of the coffee were happening at the same time. So it was really clever. So it's just a little trick there because instinctively we, we look at the short queue and think it will be faster. Um, but uh, it depends where the actual bottleneck is in the system. Right, two little tiny bits more. Do you remember in the whiteboard story, uh, the CIO said to me, look, look, um, you, 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 it doesn't matter um, if you can't find anything because I've got these developers, I can chuck them at the thing in three months time. Uh, six of the best developers we've got, I'll chuck them at it and the problem will go away. Now, what you've seen is that developers weren't the bottleneck. So actually, if they had done this, would it make the situation better or worse? All it would have done is it just added more stickies to the testers board. Um, and it would have made it actually a lot worse. And in fact, in the real world, once they got um, these few changes we put in, they got a 30% increase at least in throughput. Um, and they cut down their numbers and they also actually let two of the developers uh, leave that team and go work on project work. Um, so if you're looking at this from the accountant's point of view, uh, they increased their throughput by 30% at least, and they cut their costs uh, by roughly 10%. Uh, and this is the surprising thing, uh, the lady, there she is there. Her real name, by the way, was Elaine. Uh, I called her Eve in the book. We met up a wee while later and she said, look, since we put that in, everything's stuck. We've fine tuned it a bit. Um, we, we're using the system that, that you helped us kind of figure out. Um, it's great because we are now collaborating uh, and we're sitting next to each other and we, we're using these boards and we all talk about the same stuff all day with the team. The test team aren't separate. They're actually like core to the team now uh, and they're so much happier. And we've never worked so few hours before while I've been managing this team. Um, uh, and the place has never been so calm and uh, everyone's going home on time. Uh, and at the same time though, we've never completed so much work. So, so it, it's, it's, it just doesn't make any sense, Clark, but we've calmed down and we've sped up. And, and that was the, 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 the I think that the, the, the bit where I decided to actually write this book uh, because this particular story, it, it sums up every situation. If you have a bottleneck, it causes chaos uh, and they can be really sneaky, the bottlenecks, and they cause all sorts of rework and hassle and grumpiness and they create silos. But then when you go and find your bottleneck, you can't help but look at your system and realize it's just a really important part um, of your whole system. And you have to stop treating your system as a bunch of silos. You have to start collaborating. You have to go through that focus formula um, where collaborating is key, uh, but it gives you an operating system for, for becoming more productive. Um, and it always calms things down. Uh, always calms things down. And so I'll go back to a point I made just a few minutes ago, um, which was that if you don't know where your bottleneck is, then it's managing you because you have a bottleneck. Um, so if you don't know where it is, uh, you do have one, it's managing you. The moment you find it, uh, you'll find it's causing a lot of rework, which is counterintuitive, uh, but it's causing a lot of rework. Uh, it's wasting uh, a lot of effort and it's causing a lot of stress. And, and so just finding it, setting up this simple system to, to manage around it, just speeds things up and calms things down. Right, so that's the end of that. I just wanted, there, there's the share.toc guide. Um, you go to that, you can get a free copy um, of the bottleneck rules 
book, um, you do get signed up uh, and you go into my email system thing. Uh, but once you've got the book, if you don't want to be on an email system, you can unsubscribe. Uh, it's surprising, very, very few people do that. I, I, I send more stuff um, out. Uh, if you'd like to contact me, my uh, email address is clark at tusc.guide. There's an E on the end of Clark. And if you're really, really, really keen, um, I'm putting together a course on this and it's in the beta phase and I've got 90% off the, the, the price of it right now. Um, uh, but it, it's a beta um, and I require feedback and you'd have to be keen and patient because I've never put an online course together before. But e email me if you're interested. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate just as much feedback as I can get. Um, yeah, and that's that. And I'm going to stop sharing now. And hopefully when I do that, I'll see some faces. There we go. You can start seeing by my face, which maybe is not... Hey, good. what a beautiful face. <laughs> if so, I'd known that face was going to greet me, I would have come back to that uh, much sooner. <laughs> um, we have a QA and a system, we've got the chat system. If anybody has any question or anything, um, we can take a few questions. Um, so we have a question here for you uh, from Gendi. Uh, it says, does the curate value step in focus cover WIP limits? Uh, Actually, no, there's something I haven't sh shown in here, um, but um, they're, they're, the, the, the whip limits are implied in having an agile team um, and the slowing down. Um, remember the buffalo have to slow down, that the, uh, the slowing down is saying find a way to slow down and putting whip limits on um, is, is one way to do that. Um, one very good way. Um, yeah, yeah. But curation is the stuff that says, Effectively in an agile team, look, what's on your backlog? Um, take into account that we now know we have a, a, a bottleneck. How would we order it given that we know that the bottleneck determines our output? Um, and, and, and how can we curate it ruthlessly, which is a, a, an agile practice that um, a lot of us find very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Good question. Very good. Any other question, anyone? I see a lot of people have just signed up for the book there. I get little email notifications. So, <laughs> I, I've got to say go that, um, I've got to say that, that the, the book is, is fabulous. And it's uh, another before when you had rolling, rolling hills, that rolling rocks downhill, um, you That's had for a while yeah. that, that book available for, for free and it was incredibly generous. And I get, I get your book through um, the, the, the bottle, bottleneck rules as well through, through your, Cool. What awesome. tell people with that book is if they read the first two, two or three pages, they'll they'll know if they want to read the rest, and and yeah. it's only ninety minutes. Yes. Yeah. I should be looking at it because I have it. Oh yeah, there you are. You see? Ah, oh. here. Ah, here we go. And the, what's amazing thing is that when you get a when you get a theme book, that usually means that someone has actually paid attention. <laughs> Great books are thin, not thick. <laughs> so Indeed. we got a question. <laughs> uh, this was the question. Have you had have you had situations where people are unwilling to acknowledge the bottleneck is there? Oh, great question. Uh, oh, that, that's a good question. Um, it, it, so so I focus on focus, focus, focus on agile teams, and usually that they, they have had enough work done with them that they have a collaborative trusting environment and they can talk about these things so usually what i find that the difference is that once they maybe say hear that joke they have an insight uh and then they have a little laugh and then everyone can work around it that, that's not always the case though um quite often being seen as the bottleneck uh, it's not the sort of thing you can stick your hand up and say, hey, look, we're the bottleneck, we need some help, because you get blame. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of it is um, 
cultural. It, 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 in the book, I have this, I just love this little example. It's from um, a friend of mine, uh, Derek Sivers, who's kind of uh, internet famous. He ran a company called CD Baby. And he told me about how um, he had this really successful company and they had printer uh, was the, became the, the bottleneck. And uh, his people that were doing the packing of the, the CDs that they were sending out um, would come and complain to him because it was slowing them down. Uh, now, in that case, they were all there together and they were collaborating. So the silos were kind of geographically just, just right next to each other and they talked over lunch and stuff. If that had been in a much bigger company um, and you had this area here and this area here um, arguing uh, with each other politically and the printers have been run by one general manager and the other, uh, the, um, the packing team had been was done by warehousing in a different city, then getting them to work together is a lot, lot, lot harder. Um, but that, that's often the skill of the process of something like this is, is working through and getting people to be able to see that whole system um, okay. and to just go, oh, look, if we tweak that there, it'll make it better for everyone. But there must, there must be also a, um, a situation that there has to be an element of readiness for the company or the, or the team or the organization to be willing yes. to do it. In fact, when I look back, most of the situations have been um, urgency. It's been a disaster. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and so it, it's not the only step, but finding the bottleneck in a, in a really messy situation um, mm -hmm. because everyone's desperate to fix it. Uh, people are usually in a frame of mind to just act and do what they, they need yeah. to do rather than fight so much. If, so I had a question. if I had a question there, it's, it's, is this something, uh, being the bottleneck, being also a potential survival mechanism? As in, oh, if you're the bottleneck, yes. you are protected. <laughs> well, often, um, actually, usually it's not. Usually people that are, in a, are really stressed and they're unhappy. I do remember there have been... Hmm. Sorry, that... They may not be healthy, but... <laughs> It's not healthy. Um, I have had a few situations uh, where a, a person has been the bottleneck uh, and they have liked having that power that comes um, with, with it. And they would create themselves, like, like um, they would create code, for instance, uh, which meant that they felt they were indispensable. Uh, and then they would become a knowledge bottleneck uh, and an entire organization could run at the winds of that. I've seen the situation like in a, uh, uh, an operations team where I think maybe similar to the Phoenix um, book, exactly. uh, where they have one operator who is incredibly powerful. And quite often um, for them, there's a huge status thing uh, that's often not earned through being good at their job, but being good at... Um, power uh, plays uh, and that, that, that requires um, some really you usually see fairly strong um, deliberate intervention yes okay let's go another question this is from uh, Robbie May uh, can technical debt be a bottleneck ah uh, so, so if you look at, um, you get kind of, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put it slightly differently. So if, if Agile, um, if you go through, you've got an Agile team, they're working in small batches, you found their bottleneck so that they are running uh, at full speed. Uh, you've made sure that the bottleneck is actually in the right place, which should be development, shouldn't be any other role. Uh, so they've got a good quality upfront stuff feeding into them. You've done everything right. Then you get to a point when the thing that is slowing you down most is the ability to change your code fast enough mm -hmm. uh, and in which case the, the 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 malleability of your code determines how fast your team goes so it, it, if you by analogy um if you've got a city that's got um conflicting traffic lights that cause all sorts of jams and all sorts of things like that uh and then you suddenly sort that out so that the um the process side of it the work actually just starts flowing um, mm -hmm. Then and people speed up. If you can take that to an extreme, you get to a point where the the, the, the speed of the cars, um, mm -hmm. the cars' engines, um, say determine the, the speed of the speed of it. 
Uh, normally, um, Rob, Rob, you may though the the the, the, the the there's so much process, simple process stuff that you can do, um, and getting people working together and collaborating, um, and collectively trying to work as a team around their bottleneck. Um, that the, the that stuff just comes so much faster. So it's the stuff you actually have to do first before you, you can usually tackle your technical debt. Yeah, cool. Let's do two more questions. Oh, three more questions. Um, uh, first one, Genti, she's asking, oh, is he asking, uh, can you elaborate how can you use buffers? Uh, how can you use buffers to smooth the bottleneck? Ah, okay, so to smooth the flow of the bottleneck. Okay, if you're in a factory and you've got a machine and it's um, uh, a bottleneck, it, it is the bottleneck and the whole system is running at the speed of the bottleneck. Um, you don't want the bottleneck to run out of work. So you put a bit of, um, you, you make sure that the things that are upstream of it run fast enough that they can always just have enough pile of work just in front of that bottleneck machine so that if something goes wrong upstream um there's a bit of a buffer uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a pile of work there the, the machine can work on while they're fixing the um, problem that's that's broken um upstream and, and that's just that's the simplest idea of, of a buffer so if you um looked at the example of uh, the, the post room, um, Sinead, uh, sorry, not the post room, the, the, the invoices. One of the things that we actually put in place there is, is that Sinead, yeah, she was the one that was the bottleneck. She worked through stuff, but she put in a rule that every morning, the first thing in the morning, rather than later in the morning, the office junior went down to the mail room um, and got uh, the invoices and took them out of the envelopes uh, and then distributed them around the team to work on them. So that when they came to the step that Sinead would do, she would book a time from one to two and she would sit down every day and just go through and bang, 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 bang. So by making sure that we scheduled stuff so that it happened every day beforehand, um, uh, you didn't have Sinead coming in through a one to two session and finding, oh, there's none done. Oh, no, no, we didn't start till later or, or whatever. So, so you can take that idea of just not letting the bottleneck run out of work by, by that building that. That could be akin to saying, like, if you're working in a scrum team, um, make sure that the backlog is not empty. Bottleneck. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the backlog is your bottleneck. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's, it's your buffer. Um, and, and it's also the, the thing that um, you, you pull from. So it creates the whip limits uh, as well. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. OK, let's go to another question from Don McClellan. Um, hi, Don. Uh, process improvements sometimes th slow things down before they take effect and speed up. Do you ever see that? Do you ever see that we are busy to take time to improve? Ah, so there's a, a statement and a question there. Yeah, we're yes. always too busy um, to, to take time to improve. Um, and, and that's why, unfortunately, you, just, you have to wait until it gets to a crisis point um, before people okay. do it. Yeah. But um, if, if someone was having a retrospective, um, uh, next week, and and odds are, if there's an agile um, audience listening, there, there will be a retrospective. Uh, well, you, well, um, you could just start that retrospective. Right, let's just check it. I want to tell you a joke. And then I just want to see what comes out of it. Um, and then they'll talk through, and they'll almost always find uh, that testing is actually uh, in a, in a newish agile team at the bottom there. And they go, oh. Okay, so what do we have to do to, to do that? And I've had the same kind of discussion um, that, that, that I had. Though, um, yeah, yeah. So, so people don't like to improve. It doesn't take long. The thing with the bottleneck is it, it takes such a tiny amount of time um, proportionate to the um, huge improvements that you get. Uh, I, I had one example last year where I worked with a government department um, who they were doing agile that required a six month testing phase at the end of it. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how that works, but uh, they, they got me in because their agile, their, their testing phase was a mess. Uh, and it was a government department and the head of that department had realized, oh, uh, 
if this testing keeps at this rate, then we're going to be, we're running way, way, way behind. Uh, and then he would have to go speak to the Prime Minister uh, and to the Minister of Finance and explain what was going on, because it had all sorts of um, cost and, uh, and, and delivery um, implications. Uh, it, was, it was a real mess. And so I sat down with one of his um, guys and over about two hours, we, we just drew out the, their testing process. We identified, this was on Thursday afternoon, we identified um, where their bottleneck was inside their testing process, which is much, much harder to do than it is in an agile team. Uh, we found one little point where it was, we agreed that's where it was, we brainstormed just a few things to do, um, and that took less than two hours, uh, and then, um, he was went back to his team, um, and then on Tuesday he called me to say they were going four times faster. Uh, so that's unusual. Normally it's about 20, 30, 40 percent faster, but this was four times faster for the sake of a two hour meeting. That's great. <laughs> All right, let's do um, there's two more questions here. Um, hopefully, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't want to extend much from there. Um, so, a question from Andres Gutierrez uh, it says, like, do you have any other real life examples where you uncovered a, an invisible bottleneck? Yeah, have, have a look in, um, well, actually there was one there, the, um, the, the uh, government department, um, yeah, it was 120 people, the one I just described, 120 people, the bottleneck was hidden um, and no one knew. And they'd been running this way for months. Uh, and then we went through and we found it and they go, oh my God, and it was really because before that they hadn't looked at the system um, as a whole and tried to go and find, look, where's the one point um, that we need to tweak um, uh, and to do it. And, and that's it. So um, the, the book's got, it, the, the, the little book's got examples of, um, uh, from, from all sorts of, of areas. There's stuff from, um, there's a surgeon uh, and they're really, really interesting story about a surgeon and what he did. Um, there's an airport, uh, there's some coffee shops, there's, uh, there's all sorts of um, things. And, and, and it's surprisingly easy once you, but what's missing uh, is the idea, the concept of, ah, a bottleneck. And once you've got that concept and a little bit of the, 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 the focus formula I mentioned, you can go a long way. Um, but before that, you couldn't see bottlenecks because you didn't know they were um, so important. Cool, excellent. Let's do another one. Um, okay, so Darren Aitison. Um, hi, Darren. Uh, if the first step of the process is the bottleneck, that is, that there is a massive backlog of work, um, what's the best way to handle that? Um, and then he's a comment here says, like, uh, he recalls an instructor on a, on a Kanban course remarking that big backlogs are a really bad thing. Ah, okay, so backlog is just a list. Um, no, no one really ever thinks that they're going to get through all the backlog. Um, so, but let, let's just take that. So there's, um, you, you find the bottleneck. So um, if you want to get through the, the, the backlog faster, so you, you find it, there'll be one step inside the, the, the team. And it should be your developers. If it's not, you want to change the structure so it is your developers. Um, uh, you, you optimize, you find that uh, step and you go, what are they doing? And you go, oh, okay, they're doing this. And then you look at the coordination. How are they coordinating their work? And you go, well, that's interesting. This person um, needs it here, but um, all the other ones are, uh, there's, there's lots of little sort of coordination things that can, can uh, improve it. Um, uh, then you look and you go, well, how could we help that bottleneck? Let's collaborate. How could we um, curate the work, which is now we're talking about the backlog. And I, I, I swear uh, that the, the most valuable thing that anyone could do is not do Agile. Um, Agile's cool, I love it, don't take me wrong. It's, it's, um, it's just the most amazing thing that you ever, but don't start with Agile, start by curating your backlog, sitting down um, with, with your customers and saying, hey, look, if you want the most value out of this, we have to ruthlessly manage the scope uh, that you go into the team. Um, so why don't we, uh, chop this thing down um, to quarter of the size, and we'll have two backlogs. One is the one that's really important. Um, the other one is the stuff that we'll get to later. Uh, if you do that, then we can get the team running, and you'll make so much more money than you ever thought, 
um, and we can get our agile team up and running. Um, but that ruthless prioritization uh, mm -hmm. tends not to happen. And, and it's a problem um, with, with, with agile, if you lift it up outside the team, is that the management skills to have those discussions often aren't there now. And because we're doing agile, often we don't value the management skills. And so those types of discussions don't happen. So often the actual manager is the bottleneck, often the tech leads. In fact, that's one thing I should say, just for people who are still here, um, which is most of you actually, see, um, <laughs> it's not just the people who do the work that can be the bottleneck. I'm working um, with a, a company, I, I do mentoring over Zoom with them, and uh, their bottleneck, and it's caused a huge amount of quality problems, uh, is technical lead capacity. So they've got lots of junior and mid-experienced people doing lots of work, but they haven't had the leadership from the, the technical lead, the tech leads um, guiding them. So they've created a lot of uh, rework. That's an example of a hidden bottleneck because it's been like that for a long time. And when they realized that that was the cause, um, they realized that, that they, they got their recruitment in to, um, to sort that out, which is stri going straight um, from the focus to the upgrade. Uh, sorry, from the fine to the upgrade. The fine to the upgrade. Excellent. All right. Now, last one. Another question from uh, Robbie May, and this is just the last, this is the last one. Um, if the bottleneck requires some significant financial investment um, to overcome, mm -hmm. um, how do you convince management to invest to improve productivity? I strongly recommend you hire an external consultant um, <laughs> so that you have someone else to give the message. Uh, well, actually, seriously, um, some pe people always say they need more, more, more money. Now, actually, what, what I seriously recommend is that um, if you go through and you find your bottleneck and your system, um, spending money is not the first thing you're doing. There, there's um, Lord Rutherford, who, who actually just, he was born just around the corner from where I live here. Um, so he must be pretty cool. Um, we never met because he died a long, long time ago. He split the atom um, in, I think he was in Manchester at the time. So he was the, the he got the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, he, there, there's some famous quote he has where he comes into the room and says, gentlemen, I have bad news. We've run out of money. So we are going to have to think. <laughs> and what I have almost consistently found is that um, our, our instincts had to go from find the bottleneck to ah, upgrade it, spend money. Um, it, it doesn't take long. It takes a few hours to run through and use that focus formula to brainstorm a few ideas uh, and just use the, brain, the, the, the focus formula as prompts to think, how could we coordinate? How, how could we, what could we do to collaborate? Just come up with a bunch of ideas. And usually the, the, the improvement that you get out of um, of just discussing it and, and, and trying to solve the problem before you just spend money um, is, 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 is huge. But if you go through that and you can't do it, you go, well, our only option is to go money, then that, that, that is, is money, then um, that's brilliant because you've gone through, you've got a coherent argument to, that you can explain to people and then it becomes a decision that someone else has to make. I'll give you one really quick little example. It was a CEO at a hospital. Um, I spoke to him, he ran three hospitals in the UK. He got asked to um, build a new uh, sur surgery for his ophthalmic surgeons in one of the hospitals. Uh, he um, went and he spoke to them. He looked at some numbers. They had a really nice long chat and they discovered that they lost, that, that they could increase their current capacity by 24% and reduce their working hours by putting two chairs outside the surgery room um, where the next passenger could wait. That's like the buffer. Um, so have the, 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 the patient sitting outside the surgery rather than having them sit in a waiting room 200 meters away where they had to be escorted down by a nurse. And that cut out coordination, which is the first C, um, cut out coordination problems, cut out delays, just build a little buffer um, and they increased their uh, surgery rate by 24%. And they cut down their working hours and they didn't need a new multi-million pound uh, surgery. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Wish I'd done that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll finish the questions now. I, I just want to say thanks again, um, Clark, for giving us your morning. Um, 
It's my really pleasure. Really like, this is this is this was the first experiment in doing this remotely. Um, as you say, I was listening to you, and it was just reminding me of a few years ago having a coffee together in Edinburgh in a, in a coffee, yep. and it just felt like we were doing something similar again. So even if there are like so many thousand kilometers away from it, between us, so I've got my coffee. Everyone. Yes, <laughs> um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, uh, this this has been recorded, so now we have the technical challenge of making it available. Um, but be in touch, enjoy the books, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, guys. Thank you for having me.